Just make sure I get the right chapter up. I think I have the right chapter, but let me just make sure. Oh, if you're all set, getting the chapter and stuff ready. I am. It's like I have an eyelash in my eye. What a great way to start out the stream. Fantastic. Yay. Hello, everyone, and hello, Angela. And thank you so, so much. God, just, oh, Angela, appreciate it so much. Couldn't get past the Swedish chef voice for multiple characters. <laughs> well, uh, I am glad you're enjoying our uh, A Song of Ice and Fire content as well, because it's kind of it's kind of sitting on the low-key side with all the Harry Potter action that's going on. You're focusing on that stuff, but yeah. But yes, thank you very, very much, and we are so glad you... Uh, you're vibing with our uh, Clash of Kings readings. Even if they sound like Shed of the Swedish Chefs. Shed of Swish. <laughs> no, I think she's saying the other reading sounded like Swedish Chef, not us. Mm. Or me, rather. Yeah. I want to know who sounded like Swedish Chef. Which <laughs> character? Which character was it? I'm trying to, was it Arya the last chapter we read? I think. No, and I'm saying she's not saying I sound like Swedish Chef. I think oh. she's saying she's saying someone else sounds like Swedish Chef. Oh. Someone else who reads. Or another audiobook or something she was listening to. Listening to another reading. Myself. For multiple characters. Oh. Okay. I thought you meant like one of the character voices you did sound like Swedish Chef. I was trying to think like, wait. That's why I was trying to explain okay. it to you twice. Yeah. Okay. No, not me. That makes a lot more sense. Though. Not me. I don't. I mean, I was about to go back and listen. Like, oh wait, who who did? Well, I would hope you would tell me if you thought I sounded like Swedish Chef. Well, no, I didn't. I, well, I'm, I'm I'm just saying. I would hope you would tell me if one of my characters sounded jacked. I mean, might not be all that. Swedish Chef. Might work for some character. Yeah, I don't know who. I don't know. <laughs> We'd love to check it out, though. So, yeah, you could totally send it to us. Yep. would be interested just to see. Oh, so speaking of something a viewer pointed out, uh, one of our viewers sent us a, a video link that had a fact about Harry Potter and the filming of Harry Potter. So, at one point, I asked what the hook was about on Voldemort's, Voldemort's Wand. Mm. Turns out that the actor who played Voldemort... Ray Fiennes. Ray Fiennes actually asked for it to be added to the wand so that he could better control the wand while being more snake-like. Ah, very So cool. that is 100% So he could, like, hook just... it into his fingers and do the yeah. whole... So... That is 100% just to his preference and his interpretation of the character and helping his, uh, yeah, his ability to. Because when Voldemort. he was cast as Voldemort, mm -hmm. unlike some actors, he decided to read the books. Oh. Just throwing it out there. Wait, who didn't, who didn't read the books? Well, I know the Dumbledore guy, but yeah, that's that's it. Um, oh, and the guy who directed *Goblet of Fire* barely read the fourth book because it was too big. And then Daniel Radcliffe and Rupert Grint, I'm pretty sure, read the books. I don't. They know all, all they all the all the kids read the books. Yeah, yeah, all the kids read the books. And if they hadn't read the books, I'm pretty sure Christopher Columbus had like wanted them to at least read the first book. Well, I. I don't know. It's just, I'm no actor, but for me, if I was going to get into a character, wouldn't you research that? Wouldn't you just go and read the With source the material? material? You, think? you would think. I don't know. You know, um, what's his name? Played the Joker. Died. Heath Ledger. Heath Ledger. Went crazy because he locked himself into the room, in a hotel room, by himself for like 60 days. So they could get into the insanity state. <clears throat> but these people can't even read a book. It's sad. 
I mean, Daniel Day-Lewis gets so into character, he can't get out of character. That's why he quit acting for a while. Fair enough. Because he couldn't... It was taking such a psychological toll on him to get into the character and then get out of the character. Yeah. Hi, Joshua. Hello. How's it going? Welcome. How's it been going? Yeah, I don't know. Like, I feel like that's the way you, you really get into a character and how you do well in your acting career is... If there's source for material for the oh, yeah. character you're playing, sure. I would think so. But, I don't know. What do I know? Yeah, it's true. I don't know. I'm just a guy who talks about books on YouTube. I'm just a person who reads books on YouTube. Yeah. And then talks about them. It comes up with funny voices for all the characters. I can't cry on cue. I used to be able to. I can, like, pretend I'm crying on cue. I used to actually just be able to make, like, tears come out whenever I wanted. It was great when I was a kid. <laughs> Pretty sure that's, like, how I learned how to do it. It's like, I don't remember learning how to do it. But I know as a kid, you know, so on something just... Tears come out. I can't do it anymore, though. It's been so long. Yeah, I never did that. Oh. Should have been an actor, man. Could have been great. It's not just about... Craster is the Swedish chef. Oh, that's great. <laughs> <laughs> that's great. Oh, I haven't thought about how I want Craster to sound when I read him. I feel like I have a lot of really gravelly old man voices in the story already. I need something that comes. Stay away from that girl. That's my wife and my daughter. Yeah, no, but I've already got Jon Snow that, yeah. and Jor. I was gonna say I was leaning a little bit more towards Batman on that one. Yeah, no, I think I think we'll have to go with something different. I'll have to think about it. I'm not sure. I have to go now, Commissioner, because I'm Batman. Yeah, no, I don't think that's gonna work. Not for Craster. No. Also, I can't do that. What? Batman. No? No. That's surprising, considering how your range of voices that you can't do like a gravelly deep voice. David reads A Song of Ice and Fire, Chapter 23, John Caracol. All right. Ooh, ooh. Definitely try it. All right. We're going to we're gonna look at this. We're going to take it. We're going to check mm -hmm. it out. That's awesome. Thank you. We're going to have to. Yeah. Oh, maybe, we can, maybe we can do a quick reaction if we end up like last time where we had like 10 15 minutes in between our oh discussion. before we do our harry or before yeah. we do our stephen king discussion all right yeah we didn't have enough time to read another chapter but yeah wasn't quite we'll, noel just wasn't quite there yet we'll uh see if we have some time we'll try to check it out here before we yeah. before we switch over that's funny <laughs> All right, so speaking of getting into it, should we get into it? Yeah, why don't we read some All the Young Dudes and see what's going on with Remus Lupin today. Oh, next chapter. There we go. Remember, this, the chapter title like didn't give anything away. Chapter 38, second year. The Long Last Day, Part 1. So it's very long. It takes two parts. Mm -hmm. Okay. Friday, 29th of June, 1973. Remus was running late, and there was still so much to do. As usual, he'd slept later than the rest of the marauders, and by the time he woke up, Peter was the only one left, scurrying out of the door with a quick, Morning, Lupin! Good luck! Checking the clock, Remus leapt out of bed and ran for a shower in a state of panic. As he combed his hair in the mirror, thinking glumly that this might be the last time, as Matron was sure to shave him bald as soon as he was back at St. Edmund's tomorrow, he ran through the list in his head. Breakfast first, of course. Couldn't miss that. If he got a move on, then he might just catch James and Peter before they set off on their own missions. 
it would likely be his only chance to see them because today, the very last day of term, the usually united marauders would be conspicuously separate until the feast. <coughs> After breakfast, he would have to run back upstairs to pack. Remus was quite sure that they would have a detention coming their way that evening and he might not have enough time next morning before they had to catch the train. Once he'd packed, he needed to return his library books. This filled him with a sense of guilt. He still hadn't found anything to help Sirius despite weeks of research. Their only hope now was that the Black Cousins would be able to find a way out of the engagement after the betrothal ceremony had taken place. On his way to the library, he'd be able to drop off his subject applications form at McGonagall's office. He'd put that off far too long already. Then, books returned and form handed in, Remus thought he'd have ample time to meet Peter outside the greenhouses at eleven o'clock, where he sh would collect the invisibility cloak. As long as everything went by clockwork, Remus should be able to take the umbrellas he needed from the gamekeeper's sheds on the ground and smuggle them back to their dorm room. Then it would be about lunchtime. Remus was hoping to use that hour to finish reading his book in peace. He'd borrowed it from Sirius and only had a chapter left, so he really wanted that out of the way before they all had to go home especially as he sincerely doubted that McGonagall would allow him to read during his inevitable detention that evening. Shortly after lunch, that, the first stage of the Marauder's end-of-term plan, would come into effect. He would avoid the mayhem and double-check he'd packed everything, possibly doing a bit of Sirius's packing too, because the other boys still hadn't done it, and Remus suspected he was leaving it to the last minute. Then the preparations for the feast would begin. All he had to do was show up early enough to help James and Sirius with the final incantations. This was provided, of course, that none of them got caught before then. There was a sudden knock on the bathroom door just as Remus was pulling up his jeans. Toast out here for you, Mooney, Sirius's voice called. Thought I'd save you some. Oh, great, cheers, Remus called back, pulling up his shirt quickly, as if Sirius might see him through the wood. Good luck. See you this afternoon. Yeah, you too. Remus heard Sirius's footsteps retreat and disappear down the staircase. Well, at least that was one thing taken care of. He emerged from the steamy bathroom and saw the plate of toast sitting on his trunk. Four slices. Sirius had not been stingy, and each liberally coated with a different spread. Remus grinned and renewed his pledge to help Sirius pack later on. He spent a leisurely hour munching on the toast and collecting up various belongings which had spread themselves far and wide from his bed to his friend's shelves, even down in the common room. He took the opportunity to play Hunky Dory one last time, saying a fond goodbye to the record player for a few months. The David Bowie print Sirius had given him for his birthday no longer moved, which, Sir which Remus was somewhat glad for, because at least that meant he could take it back to St. Edmund's without arousing any suspicion. His trunk didn't seem to close as easily as it had at the end of last summer, when he'd been on his way to Hogwarts, and he had to rearrange the item several times before everything squashed inside. Remus brushed his teeth and went to gather his library books, stuffing them into his threadbare satchel. He wondered if Matron might let him have a new school bag. Mind you, last time he'd asked for one, she'd taken the opportunity to teach him how to sew. A life skill, she'd said. He didn't bother telling her that repairing that the repairing charm worked much better, but even that wasn't much use anymore. With his list of chosen subjects in hand, he handed down into the common room where every other Gryffindor seemed to be doing their last-minute packing too. The usual cosy space was in an uproar, with shouts pleading for the return of missing books and games, students crawling under tables and lifting sofas hunting for long-lost items, Groups of tearful seventh-year girls hugging, hugging everyone goodbye, and owls swooping this way and that. Remus! Mary stopped him on his way out. You all by yourself? Yeah, he nodded with a mischievous grin. She grinned back. Oh, what are you planning? Me and Marlene were just saying how you've been quiet for the last few weeks. Ask me no questions, and I'll tell you no lies, he replied. Sorry, but I've got to return my books. Lily's looking for you, she said quickly. Oh, um, I'll be in the dining hall for lunch. Bit busy until then. Tell her sorry. With that, he hurried through the portrait hall and out into the corridor, which was just as busy with students rushing back and forth, saying their last-minute goodbyes. Peeves, caught up in the excitement, had obviously found out wherever Filch had stored the toilet roll and was flinging... <clears throat> wherever Filch stored the toilet roll and was flinging wads of wet tissue at anyone who got close enough. 
Oh, that's disgusting. Wet with what? <laughs> the text does not specify. Okay. Imagination can run wild on this one. Arms over his head, Remus scurried toward McGonagall's office just as Peeves fired at the door. Remus ducked just in time, and Peeves flew off, laughing maniacally as McGonagall, having heard the very loud splat, opened her office door. She peered down at Remus, still squatting and covering his head. Mr. Lupin! He was Peeves! He stood up quickly. Honestly, Professor, I believe you. She gave a small smile. Spirits are always high on the last day of term. Have you got something for me? The old teacher glanced at the parchment he was clutching. Oh, yes. He stuck out his hand. Excellent. Do come in, Lupin. Er... Uh, he could hardly say no to McGonagall or ask her if it could wait till later. He wondered what on earth she wanted. Surely Sirius and James hadn't been caught already. It would be pretty obvious as soon as phase one of the plan was initiated, and he'd heard nothing. Sit down, Mr. Lupin. Tea? Uh, yeah, okay. He sat down uneasily. McGonagall waved her wand, and the little tartan teapot on her desk began to pour its contents into two matching cups. Help yourself to the milk, the professor said up absent-mindedly as she scanned the list of parchment he'd given her. Divination, she said. Muggle studies and arithmancy. He didn't say anything. She looked up finally, surveying him over the tops of her square spectacles. These are the same subjects Mr. Potter and Mr. Black have chosen, if I'm not much mistaken. Mr. Pettigrew too, hmm? Remus just nodded. Actually, Peter was only taking divination and muggle studies. He'd, have, he'd found out that you needed to select a minimum of two new subjects and decided, had not <coughs> decided not to push himself any further than necessary. Remus would rather die than take on less work than James is serious. I'm interested to know what prompted you to select muggle studies in particular, considering a future in muggle liaisons, perhaps? Uh, Remus stammered. He had no idea what the Muggle Liaison's office was, but it didn't sound very interesting. I'd have thought you'd have sufficient knowledge of the Muggle world, having spent so much of your life in it. Yeah, but... well... There are no need for you to take subjects simply because your friends are, Mr Lupin, Professor McGonagall said more kindly than he'd expected. You'll still be taking some of the, the same core classes, after all. Remus shrugged. He didn't know what else to do. Really, all the subjects had interested him. Okay, perhaps not muggle studies, she was right there. But in the end, he hadn't much liked the idea of missing out on lessons with the other marauders. One of the most wonderful things about school, Mr Lupin, McGonagall began tactfully, is the friends we make, connections and relationships that last a lifetime. I know I've made some very dear friends at Hogwarts. Remus fought a grimace. Did she have to make it sound so girly? She cleared her throat, clearly amused by his reaction. Some very dear friends. But school is also the place to challenge ourselves, to test our mettle. Do you understand? He nodded blankly. She sighed, sipping her tea. Your exam results were excellent this year, Remus. He straightened up a little at that. He was pretty chuffed with the results himself. He hadn't beat James at Transfiguration, or Snape and Lily at Potions, but in everything else he had some of the highest marks in his class. As such, McGonagall continued, I have no concerns in, you per in permitting you to study arithmancy, which I must tell you is one of the most challenging courses we offer at Hogwarts, but I would question whether Muggle Studies is a suitable use of your time going forward. You might find it very dull, I'm afraid. Have you considered, for example... Ancient runes? Remus twisted his hands in his lap. It had sounded quite interesting, but he'd spent so much time struggling to read English and catching up with the rest of the students that he balked at the idea of learning another language. McGonagall seemed to sense his concerns, at least in part. <laughs> you wouldn't find it as difficult as you think, you know. You're an immensely gifted scholar and a very hard worker. In addition, your fellow Gryffindors, Miss MacDonald and Miss McKinnon, will be in the same class. That didn't sound too bad, actually. He was very fond of the two M's now, and it would be fun to spend a bit more time with them. How nice it would be to have a lesson in which there was no serious showing off. 
no Peter trying to copy his notes, and no James trying to act like a prat to get Lily's attention. Okay, he said. I'll give it a go. Excellent! McGonagall smiled widely, looking genuinely pleased. She waved her wand over his form to amend it. Um, Professor? he asked suddenly, slightly nervous again. Yes, Lupin? I... But I was thinking about another subject, too. Maybe instead of divination? McGonagall's smile turned wry. Well, I can't pretend I've ever seen much use in divination myself. Not unless the witcher wizard concerned is genuinely gifted with the sight. Remus nodded, assuming that this meant he was not thus gifted. Well, I thought maybe... I mean, it's probably silly. James had said it was silly. A girly subject. Um, care of magical creatures, he said all in a rush. McGonagall looked genuinely surprised. That's something which interests you. Um, yeah, I suppose so. Not just because I'm, you know, but, yeah, I suppose mainly because of that. Well, it is a very interesting subject, McGonagall sipped her tea again. I would say that if you're more interested in that than divination, then by all means... Great, uh, okay, change it, he nodded, feeling a bit embarrassed, but also quite pleased with himself. McGonagall waved her hand once more. Your father was rather gifted when it came to magical creatures, you know, she said. Remus raised his eyebrows. I didn't know. Oh, yes, she nodded as if she was just passing the time of day. An expert in his field. His field? Non-human spiritus apparitions. Boggarts and ghosts, you know. Dementors, too. All rather dark, I'm afraid. Care of magical creatures mainly focuses on corporeal, that is to say, mortal creatures, but you may well share his talents. Oh, right. Thanks, Professor. He got up quickly. He didn't have time to think about his father now. He had so much to do. I've got to get to the library, he indicated his heavy bag splitting at the seams. Yes, yes, quite, McGonagall nodded. Thank you, Remus. I'll see you at the feast tonight. Yeah, bye. As he finally exited McGonagall's office, Remus glanced at the clock. It was ten to eleven. Damn. No time for the library now. He had to meet Peter on the grounds, and it usually took at least fifteen minutes to get out of the castle, providing none of the staircases forced you off track. Having his unreasonably weighty book bag, Remus sighed and set off on his way. By the time he reached the greenhouse, sweating and too hot in the bright sunshine, Peter had obviously been waiting a little while and was wringing his hands. "'There you are!' he gasped. "'I thought something beat had happened!' "'Sorry!' Remus panted, wiping his forehead with his sleeve. "'McGonagall wanted a chat. Everything go okay?' <coughs> "'Yep!' Peter nodded, eyes darting around. "'Just like James told me. Have you seen them?' "'Nope.' Everything should be okay then. Here. Peter handed Remus the invisibility cloak. Cheers. Oi, you're going back to the dorm? Sorry, read that in the wrong person. Cheers. Oi, you're going back to the dorm? Yeah, I still need to pack. Great, mind taking my books back? I wanted to return them to the library, but McGonagall... Okay. Peter took the bag. Bloody hell, Mooney! He groaned, sagging under the weight of it. I'll see you at lunch. Probably. Good luck. Peter went scurrying off back toward the castle, leaving Remus alone again. Glancing round to make sure the coast was clear, Remus wasted no time in approaching the equipment shed. He'd been in it once before for a detention in his first year. It was much bigger on the inside than it looked, and full of various tools for maintaining the expansive Hogwarts grounds. The lock did not respond to the usual Lohamora incantation, but it obviously did respond to a few quick twists with one of Lily Evans' hairpins. She'd given him the pin the evening before with a quizzical look, but hadn't asked why he needed it. Once inside, Remus acted quickly, finding the large black trunk of umbrellas. He wasn't sure why wizards still used umbrellas. Surely there were spells for protecting yourself from rain. But nevertheless, they didn't want anyone summoning them and ruining their fun. Remus covered the trunk with the invisibility cloak and cast a weightlessness charm on it before levitating the whole thing out of the shed. 
He strolled back up to the school in a leisurely manner, trying not to look as though he were up to anything at all, hiding his wand under his robe so no one could see that it was guiding the invisible trunk. It took a good half hour to navigate himself and the trunk through the castle unnoticed and without bumping into any of the other students. Several times he had to levitate the thing over his own head, which took a bit of effort and concentration. Still he did it, reaching his destination with an enormous sense of achievement. He left the trunk in the dorm room and performed a sticking charm on the lock. If anyone did try to summon it, they hopefully wouldn't be able to get it open in time to save themselves. He folded the cloak neatly and left it on James's pillow. Peter had dropped Remus's book bag at, bag at the foot of his bed, and Remus sighed to himself, realising that he would have to return the books before he could go for lunch. Hoisting it onto his back, he once more descended the staircase into the Gryffindor common room. There you are! Oh, once again he was waylaid, this time by Lily, who looked extremely flustered and extremely pleased to see him. There you are! she shrieked, grabbing his shoulders. I've been looking everywhere for you. Hi, Lily, he smiled politely. Sorry, can it wait? I've got to get to the... Absolutely not! She shook her head vehemently. Can we go up to your room? The others aren't there, are they? No, he sighed. He could go to the library later if he skipped trying to finish his book, or if his visit to Madame Pomfrey didn't take too long. He followed Lily back up the stairs. Do I want to know what that is? she asked, glancing at the big black trunk. It's a trunk full of umbrellas, he said promptly. She raised an eyebrow but didn't question him further. I've got something for you. She put down her bag on top of the trunk, rifling through it. She withdrew a very strange item. It looked like a sheet of clear plastic. Remus furrowed his brow as she handed it to him. He turned it over. Um, Lily? I'm sorry it took me so long. I had to wait ages for the acetate. My mum got it from a friend of hers who's a teacher. They use them for overhead projectors in muggle schools. Well, you know that, obviously. Remus bl nodded blankly. There had been an OHP at St. Edmund's, but it needed its light bulb replacing about three years ago, and as far as he knew, no one had yet got round to it. Got a book? Lily nodded at his bag. Get one out, I'll show you. She com he complied, curious to see where this was going. She opened, the, she opened the text at a random page, placed it on the trunk, and lay the acetate over it. Look, she said. Remus looked, about to withdraw his wand in case she wanted him to read something. She shook her head, pushing his hand away. Just look, she said. He looked again, rubbing his neck. There are three key elements to performing a successful unbreakable vow. In the first instant... What? Remus exclaimed, picking up the book and staring. Did it work? Lily looked at him eagerly. Can you read it? Uh, yeah, I... Bloody hell, Evans! He flipped the page again, replacing the acetate. It worked. It was much less fiddly than Sirius's spell. It should work outside of Hogwarts, too, she said, her green eyes sparkling. I fiddled about with the incantation bit, and there was some potion work involved but it should last a good long time. You're amazing, Remus said, still reading. Thank you so much. Quite out of the blue, Lily leapt at Remus, flinging her arms round his neck and hugging him. Taken a bit by surprise, Remus felt himself blushing. He'd never been hugged very often before, let alone, let alone by a girl. She was soft, and her hair smelled nice, like apples. Oh, Remus moving in on Lily. Moving in on was, James's woman. Was James just the last ditch effort? Was he the backup? I don't know. Remus should have been Harry's father. Maybe Remus is Harry's father. Oh. Oh. I wanted to do it in time for your birthday she said, stepping back, still smiling. But I kept messing it up. Thank goodness it worked. You'd have thought I was mental if it hadn't. Yeah, he laughed nervously, still recovering from the surprise embrace. Thank you, Lily. This is... It's such an amazing thing. You deserve it, Remus, she said earnestly. Honestly, you worked so bloody hard, and you keep up with Potter and Black. 
Remus shrugged. There was a slightly awkward pause. Look, I'll let you get on, Lily said finally. Sorry I, I waylaid you like that. See you at the feast? Yeah, yeah, definitely. Remus looked back down at the book. Oh, shit. Wait, Evans, have you got an umbrella? Uh, I think so. I might have packed it already. Unpack it, he said firmly. And take it to the feast, okay? Okay. Once she'd left, Remus allowed himself a moment to sit down. He couldn't believe she'd done it. He couldn't believe he hadn't thought of it. It was so simple, so elegant. He'd be able to read all summer. He flipped to another page. <clears throat> it is important to note that the unbreakable vow, once made, cannot be superseded by any other kind of vow, oath, or promise made thereafter, regardless of any legal or moral concerns around keeping such a vow. It is therefore pivotal that... Oh! Remus gasped suddenly. It was as if there was a click in his brain and everything had fallen into place. Oh! He leapt up. The library would have to be put off just a little while longer. The unbreakable vow. How appropriate that he began reading about that. I think Lily switched to that page for a reason. Hmm. 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 Little hints like here. This is how you get out of the situation. Maybe Lily is a clever girl. <sighs> Very appropriate pictures. Yeah. It was times like this, Remus thought, as he paced up and down the dark corridor, that he really could do with the completed Marauder's map. Unfortunately, they'd so far only managed to map three quarters of the castle and were a long way off tagging every student yet. Who is making noise? Sir. Oh, I didn't mean to scare you that much, sir. Sorry. <coughs> Remus had been waiting outside the Slytherin common room for near 20 minutes now with no luck at all. The green-robed students who passed him ignored his pleas for help, and even the bloody Baron had carried on his way with a disdainful sniff. He looked at the nearest clock. It was half past twelve. Phase one of the plan was imminent. When the common room wall opened once more, his heart sank even further. Well, well, well. Hello, Mr. Snape. Snape smirked. They said there was a mad Gryffindor on the loose, but I didn't think it'd be you, loony Lupin. Remus sighed. Piss off, Snivellus. Don't be so rude. Snape raised his wand. I ought to wash your mouth out with soap. I don't think you know how to wash, Remus replied dryly. Why, you... Can we not? Remus said irritably. It's the last day of term and there's plenty of stuff I'd rather be doing. Can you just let me in or something? Let you in? Snape's black eyes shone with amusement. Why on earth would I let you in? I need to speak to... Out of the way, Snape, you slimy git! A voice came from the wall behind Severus. Barty Crouch Jr. stepped out, followed by Regulus. Remus felt a small measure of relief. Regulus, can you get Narcissa for me? Mordio! Without warning, Crouch aimed a curse at Remus, who dodged it just in time, pulling out his own wand. Expelia! He started, but it was too late. Crouch cursed him a second time, and pain rocketed through Remus's skull, his head ringing. It was awful, but he didn't flinch. It only hurt for a little while, and he knew pain like an old friend. If they thought that something as commonplace as that would stop him, they had another thing coming. "'What do you want, half-blood?' Crouch asked, grinning madly. "'Or are you just thick, hanging around here all alone?' "'He is thick,' Severus said as two short planks. Shut up, Snape, Crouch said, turning his wand on Severus now. Remus narrowed his eyes, paying attention. Apparently Snape was bad at making friends wherever he went. Shut up, both of you, Remus finally spoke. Regu- oh. <clears throat> Sorry, that's Regulus, not Remus. 
Wrong voice. My bad. I'm fucking it all up today. Shut up, both of you. Regulus finally spoke, sounding bored. He'd been watching Remus's face the whole time. What do you want, Lupin? Better tell me before Barty fancies practising another one of his unforgivables on you. I need to speak to Narcissa, Remus said, very clearly and as calmly as he could. It's urgent. It's about, you know, black family stuff. Regulus watched him for a few moments longer, not speaking. He was so like Sirius, only without any of the joy or humour. If Remus hadn't known better, he'd have said Regulus was the older brother. Snape, go and get my cousin, will you? he said sharply, not even moving his head. Snape looked furious, but he obeyed. Did everyone do whatever the blacks told them to? James often teased Sirius for acting as though he were royalty, but perhaps he was just playing the role he'd been raised for. Crouch soon grew bored and wandered off, leaving Regulus and Remus still facing each other in stony silence. Remus was actually glad to see Narcissa's sour face when she finally came through the wall. Oh, Merlin, she said, staring down at Remus. What now? I've figured it out, he said quickly. The, the problem, I've got a solution. Oh, yes, she folded her arms, looking unconvinced. The unbreakable vow, he hurried, keen to get it all out so that he could go. It can't be broken. She snorted. Yes, that's certainly implied. Remus rolled his eyes impatiently. I mean, he said more slowly, his bravery mounting, that if you make an unbreakable vow, you can't make any other promises that go against it. You can't even be forced to make other promises or vows. He stressed the last word meaningfully. The light switched on in Re Narcissa's almost in Narcissa's eyes almost immediately. For a second, her pretty pink lips formed the same O oh that Remus had made only an hour ago before when it came to him. She did not have time to speak, however, because in the same moment there was a shriek from somewhere up the hall causing them all to turn. A Slytherin girl came bursting out of a girl's bathroom at the end of the corridor, wailing, They all just exploded, she said, looking faintly disturbed. Sure enough, they could see through the swinging toilet door behind her that waves of pink foam were spilling from the wash basins and toilets. It was truly magnificent. Gorgeous great drifts of soft soapy bubbles tumbled out of every tap and drain. I, um, I've got to go. Remus grinned, winking at Narcissa, then breaking into a run. Ah, uh, so there it is. Narcissa's gonna make the unbreakable vow to Lucius. Yep. Together forever, baby. So Through Voldemort and Voldemort. Oh yeah! In, in the end, when all that was going down, you said like Narcissa stayed with him because she truly loves him, or was it just because she made she, an unbreakable? Uh, she she had to. There was no choice. There was no alternative. I don't know. I think it's much better to think that she just loved him. That's but, nicer. Yeah. Anyway. Uh, you know, maybe unbreakable that. Possible. Merlin must be pissed right now. <laughs> the Mertz. The Mertz. <laughs> the Mertz toilet just exploded. She got mad when someone threw a book down. <laughs> now imagine pink foam exploding. Was she sitting in the U bend at the time? Exactly. <laughs> uh, you know we're. So we talked last time, like, um, I like how they kind of, you know, curve that divination, like, yeah, no, yeah, I won't take divination. So, like, who's going to be the divination teacher? Because, uh, Trelawney, Trelawney isn't later. there yet. Yeah, yeah. But. Now we don't have to have one, because Lupin's not taking the class. I wonder if we're going to run into Hagrid. Because Hagrid is there. He should be, yeah. He was talking about like the grounds building, the gamekeeper's hut. Then, yeah, yeah, the uh, the girly care of magical creatures class, right? <coughs> Find that offensive. I'd love to take care of magical creatures, right? Why is that girly? Yeah. 
What's so girly about Thestrals? And well, why is girly an insult? First of all, well, not they didn't have Hagrid teaching it at the time, so it might have just been you know the dude had missing limbs. That's true. That's true. Right? Those flower worms can get pretty heated. Also, girly is a bit of an insult. I'm just saying. Oh, Oh, one hundred percent. But you gotta remember, this took place in like the seventies. I'm just saying. Calling stuff girly in that way is offensive. Oh, 100%. But they're also. I also bad. feel like. In the 70s. He's 13. Okay, 13. In the 70s. Also, I feel like. It's a thing. Unicorns could potentially be very dangerous. Oh, 100%. You have that big horn, like someone's going to get impaled. Horses, later. horses are dangerous. Just horses by themselves. Yeah. Let alone sticking in a an impalement object never like. stand behind a horse so where do you stand around a unicorn you just don't you don't stand next to him <laughs> you stand way the f over there <laughs> who's the guy that has to collect the unicorn hair oh, i'm sure there's like a unicorn farm unicorn farriers yeah there's gotta be so i mean i mean they're nice for the most part they're not like aggressive animals they're just horses. We what we've seen. Yeah. yeah, that's true. They are horses, though. They just poop rainbows. So their their plops are rainbow colored. Yeah. They glisten. Does that make Bailey a unicorn? What? He doesn't poop rainbows. He does when he eats socks. I guess depending on what color things he's stolen and eaten. Yes, sometimes. More than that, no. And uh yeah, I'm I'm getting a vibe like Wooly might like Lupin. Just a little bit. Maybe she might be into that Maybe a little bit. bit. Might be a little bit of a seed of a something there. We should probably hop in the the next one though, because that was pretty long if the next one's gonna be long. You gonna make it? Yes. Okay. They're like feeling like they're gonna get itchy, so I'm trying not to let them get itchy. Oh. Do we have some Visine for you? I don't think I need that. I think I just need them to not be itchy. Oh, Visine for dry, itchy eyes. Red, itchy. I can't remember. I just remember Ben Stein used to do the commercial. I... He had the big balloon with the eye. I know, I know. And then he puts the stuff on it and it's not red anymore. Ben Stein would have been. Get made it. clear eyes for. Dry eyes. Ben Stein would have been a great Snape. Just gonna throw that out there just for you to imagine. I don't like it. I didn't even get into the fact that even the Slytherins hate Snake. Snape, not Snake, Snape. It is Barry Crouch Jr., though. He's he, weird. He's a little shithead, yeah, is he what is. he is. Makes sense. He's terrible so far. He's horrible. He's already got the lick going on. You know, that's the... movie. That's not book canon. I refuse to acknowledge that that's real. He's probably doing that when he's telling off Snape. Well, hello, Snape. Right, and Snape is the weirdo. What did you say? Mordio. What? <laughs> he doesn't do that in the books! Well, that's, how, that's how I picture him now. Uh, it was the weirdest thing. I didn't get why they even did that. It was just bad. Because the director didn't read the book. <sighs> Fair enough. He wanted the dragon to burn down the Forbidden Forest. Did this director, by chance, direct the last season of Game of Thrones? <laughs> you would think that he might have been involved. <laughs> Poor decision making. Anyways, let's let's get on with it. Let's go. Chapter 39. Second year. The long last day. Part 2. The rest of the afternoon was nothing short of chaotic, and Remus knew that Sirius and James, wherever they were, must be having the time of their lives. Every single bathroom in the castle had mysteriously been affected by the foam flood, and no one seemed to be able to stop it for very long. Huge drifts of bubbles clogged the hallways like pink snow, and those students who didn't want to play in it did not 
appear to mind being forced out onto the grounds to loll about on the grass and spend their last day in the sunshine. Remus, who already had to sacrifice his lunch hour, still needed to get to the library and return his books, help Sirius pack, though actually, he told himself as he pelted up the stairs to Gryffindor Tower, he'd done quite enough to help Sirius for one day, and see Madame Pomfrey for an end-of-year checkup. He also needed to get to the Great Hall early to help James and Sirius with the final phase of their plan. It wasn't complex magic, but it was strong and ideally needed as many wands as possible. Library first, he thought to himself, purposefully, as he entered the now desolate common room. At least there was no one there to hold him up now. One of the others had obviously been in the dorm room since Remus had last left it, because it was even messier than before, and the invisibility cloak was now missing. James, who was probably the tidiest of all four of them, had packed all of his things the night before and neatly made his bed. Remus's space was only tidy because it was now entirely empty except for his pyjamas and book by the bedside table. Peter had appeared to try, apparently tried to pack at some point, but had been disturbed halfway through. His trunk was flung open, various items of clothing hanging out of it, a pile of textbooks on his bed and his red tie hanging from the frame. Sirius's bed was by far the worst. It must have come up from something at some point. He must have come up looking for something at some point, because every <clears throat> every drawer in his dresser was open, his bed sheets had been ripped back, and his trunk stood completely empty. Remus grabbed his book bag and left straight away. He would think about it later. He wished he still had the invisibility cloak as he dodged peeved once, peeves once more. The poltergeist was in his element, diving into the piles of foam, then bursting out at unsuspecting students and teachers. Remus briefly remembered what McGonagall had said that morning about his father. Buggards! Poltergeists! He wondered what his father, his dueling champion Ravenclaw father who had a temper, had thought of Peeves. Good afternoon, Madam Pince, Remus said quietly and respectfully as he entered the library. It was almost entirely empty, and the pinched-faced old librarian was sorting through a towering pile of recently returned books with her wand, firing them back to their shelves with great relish. Lupin, she said, not even turning her head to greet him. She placed his books carefully on the counter furthest from her. Though the library no longer frightened him exactly, Remus was still pretty nervous round Madame Pince, who would clearly have preferred that no students be permitted to touch her precious books at all. Is that all of them? she said sharply. I shall know if not. Definitely all of them, he said, backing away slowly. <clears throat> Mr. Pettigrew has not returned poisonous plants of the British Isles, and the elder Mr. Black has three overdue transfiguration books. Oh, okay. I'll let them know when I see them. I'll sh I shall be writing to their parents if I don't have them by five o'clock. I'll tell them, he repeated almost out the door. Sighing with relief, he made his way to the hospital wing at a leisurely, play at a leisurely pace, fighting the urge to throw himself headlong into a snowball fight the Hufflepuffs were having against the Slytherins with the foam. It seemed that the spell was still going strong. Even more bubbles were emanating from the bathrooms as he passed, and if he wasn't much mistaken, they were growing larger. He had no idea where Sirius, James, and Peter were at at that moment, but he knew they had to be enjoying themselves immensely. Remus, dear, Madame Pomfrey smiled as he entered the hospital wing. Thank you for stopping by. I know you'd much, be, much rather be having fun with your friends today. He shrugged with a small smile. I don't mind. Just a few things before the summer begins. Shall we go into my office? He followed her in and accepted the plate of biscuits she offered him gratefully. His stomach was growling from having missed lunch. Now, Madame Pomfrey sat down, conjuring up his patient notes from thin air. I've tried contacting your matron in St. Edmunds a few times. It seems she's not clear on how the post works. Keeps trying to get to... <coughs> to get me to speak to her on some muggle contraption. I told her we don't have a telling bone at Hogwarts, but I don't think she believes me. Oh, Remus stifled a laugh. She wouldn't. Anyway, between us, we've managed to agree that I shall be present before and after your confinement for both full moons. I've explained to her that your condition has become more difficult over the past year, but that there should be no more danger to anyone else at the school. Right, Remus nodded. 
Now that he was used to the idea, he was quite glad Pomfrey would be there, however briefly, over the holidays. It would make the full moon slightly less grim, anyway. <coughs> You're making me nervous over here. What? I got all these drinks, and she's just walking everywhere. I want you to make sure you look after yourself in the meantime. Eat full meals and get a nice balance of rest and exercise. Remus didn't have the heart to tell Madame Pomfrey that he had very little say in when he was allowed to rest and how often he exercised while he was living at St. Edmund's. No one at Hogwarts seemed to understand what sort of an institution it was. After that, she checked on a few of his wounds from the previous moon to make sure they were healing properly, then performed some diagnostic spells. It was almost four o'clock by the time he was walking back to Gryffindor for what felt like the hundredth time that day. She's just terrible today. She, she is. Filch had had no success yet in taming the foam, but it had at least stopped spurting from every tap and drain in the castle. The others must have got bored and moved on to something else. As Remus climbed the tower, he saw a few students flying past the windows on their brooms. It was a gorgeous day outside. The other marauders were probably out there making the most of it. He got a shock when he reached the dorm. Hiya, Mooney! James grinned at him. He was alone on Sirius's side of the room. He was packing. Nice job getting the umbrellas. Yeah, well done on the foam. Filch is fuming. He rubbed the back of his head, feeling awkward. <clears throat> Where's Sirius? Doing something mental on his broom, I think. Thought I'd sort this out for him. Do you want help? Nah, don't worry. Didn't you want to read a book or something? Remus shrugged. He felt a bit embarrassed now. It seemed right that James do it, after all. James was Sirius's best, best friend. It's okay, I'll help you, he said casually, as if it didn't matter much either way. You know I hate flying. Nice of you, James smiled easily, gathering up some of Sirius's mess and sorting it quickly. Remus started tidying up the records, stacking in alphabetical order because Sirius liked it that way. Put those in my trunk, James said, nodding at the box of records. The muggle books too. Said I'd look after them for him. You know, the way things are at his dad and mo <clears throat> at his with his mum and dad. Remus nodded, carrying them over to James's bed. Going to be a rubbish summer without the two of you, James remarked, sounding genuinely sorry. Yeah. Remus replied, not really sure what else to say. Sirius thinks... He thinks he might not be coming back in September. What? Remus looked up, suddenly alarmed. James frowned. Yeah, he reckons with this betrothal thing. They might send him to Durmstrang. Keep him out of trouble until they can get him married. Pretty drastic, I think, but I wouldn't put it past them. The betrothal ceremony might not happen, though, Remus said quickly. I have a feeling. I just feel like Narcissa won't let it happen. He didn't want to tell James anything yet, because James would tell Sirius, and Sirius might get annoyed that Remus went behind his back to talk to his family. And what if that didn't even work? He couldn't get anyone's hopes up. Narcissa? said James curiously. What are you talking about? I know she doesn't want to marry Sirius any more than he wants to marry her, that's all. Remus shook his head. Shall I pack his muggle magazines in your trunk, too? What a wonderful year it's been! Dumbledore beamed at the Great Hall as the final scraps of the end-of-year feast vanished from their plates. Remus was going to miss the food more than anything, and had three helpings of pudding. Ravenclaw had won the House Cup that year, and the hall was decked out in royal blue and bronze silk banners. Every time the Ravenclaw table had cheered during the meal, Remus felt a tug behind his navel and thought of his father. Dumbledore's speech continued. I am immensely proud of all of you, of course. Now that we are all well fed, I have a few words I'd like to say. Ready, lads? Sirius whispered under his breath, so low that only the marauders could hear. Dumbledore continued. Congratulations once again to Ravenclaw. Now, winning this year's... There was a shriek from the far end of the hall, and everyone spun around to watch every single goblet on the Ravenclaw table suddenly turn... suddenly start to spurt red and gold bubbles. 
They fired upward in great geysers, hitting the ceiling and bursting in a shower of bright droplets, which fell, fell like rain onto the students below, staining their robes with streaks of Gryffindor crimson. Keep it coming, Sirius whispered, his voice high with excitement as the marauders flicked their wands using every ounce of concentration. At once the goblets at every other table erupted too, causing the same effect as students shrieked and began to duck for cover, their hair, skin and clothes staining vibrant bright red and gold. Not even the Gryffindor table had escaped. Not wanting to miss out on the fun, James had insisted on it. Lily Evans had brought her umbrella and grinned slyly at Remus as she and Marlene and Mary fought to cram underneath it. As Mary and Marlene fought to cram underneath it with her, in the far corner of the hall, Remus caught sight of a furious Narcissa hiding underneath the table, a long white hair streaked with red and gold which clashed awfully with her porcelain complexion. She was glaring at her wayward cousin so hard that Remus wondered how Sirius did not drop dead on the spot, but he comforted himself with the thought that this incident could have only cemented the idea in her mind that she must escape marriage to Sirius at all costs. Omnistratum, Dumbledore said, calmly, aiming Dumbledore said, calmly, aiming his wand at the ceiling. All caps. At once the bubbles burst and evaporated into nothing, as though a large force field had suddenly appeared over their heads. Scourgify, the headmaster smiled pleasantly, now waving his wand over the whole hall. Instantly, the red and gold paint had vanished from the tables, floor, and students. Order was restored. Ah, James sighed, sounding disappointed. An excellent way to celebrate Gryffindor's victory on the Quidditch pitch this year. Dumbledore cleared his throat as students clambered back into their seats, eyeing their goblets nervously. And while I welcome and encourage displays of house pride... I would like everyone to remember that true sportsmanship lies in the ability to gracefully seed victory. Please join me in raising your glasses to Ravenclaw, winners of the Hogwarts Cup 1973. Remus had the uncomfortable feeling that Dumbledore did not look in the though Dumbledore did not look in the Marauders direction, they were absolutely the intended audience for this admonishment. He felt a little ashamed but only a very little. It was hard to feel so sorry when there was really no harm had been done and he was so full of excellent food. James and Sirius were already planning next year's finale, Peter grinning and nodding along like a simpleton. Lily winked at Remus as they raised their goblets and he hoped that nothing would ever change. Aww. Dumbledore putting an end to all the fun. By the way, there's a cat sheath for you. Oh, thank you so much for that. It was like kneading my hand and it was like stuck in my hand. A cat sheath. Um, Yay. yeah, that, see, Fred and George never came up with any of those pranks. Come on. Fred and George. Fred and George were busy being entrepreneurs and manufacturing. Yeah, that's true. Products. It's that's a different true. kind of a thing. They were, they were more about getting out of. Also, they stuff. could have killed somebody one time. When? I mean, well, they shoved, which time? <laughs> they shoved Montague in the vanishing cabinet. Oh, yeah. I mean, technically, yeah, he came pretty close to dying there, yeah. Where did he go? Like, he they... went to uh, Schrodinger Catland. It's... <laughs> I'm just saying, they, they've done some dangerous things. Yeah. Dudley could have potentially died. Well, yeah. Choked on his own but that's tongue. what I mean. Like, most of the Marauders are just fun. Well, Fred and George are fun too. It's well, just they're, they're in the younger, but they're so in the far, experimental phase. So far, the Marauders haven't done anything really dangerous, unless you count the rainstorm over Snape that almost drowned him. But I think that's just chalked up to Snape's a little B. Every time, why you gotta be like this about Snape? A heavy rain knocked him out. <laughs> Come on! But it said in the story he didn't get like knocked out. Remember, it didn't do any physical harm to him. He well, just, no, like, he's... laid there like a lump and let it happen. What else is he, he gonna do? Dance in the rain? Like, any true person that wants to get back at someone casting a rain spell on them? 
Because you're the expert. Yeah. I am. Yeah. At dancing in rain spells. Yeah. How are you now? Yeah, 100%. It's the best time to dance because there's usually no one around to see you dance. Because everyone goes inside to get away from the rain. Rain spells in the middle of the cafeteria where every other student is sitting there watching. As like this. Well, I never said it was a great plan. So, I'm just plan. I'm just saying. I'm just saying. I'm just saying. Why don't Discord open so we can I don't know. I'm sorry I'm yawning so much. Either way I mean Fred and George did do that really awesome one when Umbridge was uh at the school. Oh yeah, the the um, the what do you call it? Fireworks. Well, they did the fireworks, but then they clogged up one the whole hallway with a bunch of stuff. I don't remember what it is. Oh yeah, the uh the super sticky like swamp. They made a swamp. They made a swamp in the school. Yeah. And then they Got their brooms out of Umbridge's office and basically told her to F off. Yeah. That was great. Are we having Discord issues? We are having Discord issues. Why are we having Discord issues? I don't know. I don't... Well, that's not good. It just doesn't want to open. Oh. So now what? Not to continue to just let the air be dead or anything, but now what? Anyway. Um Yeah, Lily and Lily and James or Lily and Remus getting to be like BFFs. But I guess it would make sense that uh she would be friends with Remus probably before she'd be friends with Remus and or James and Sirius. Yeah, this is true. Oh, shoot. <clears throat> but yeah, I, I think Snape is acting like such a stinker because no one else likes him either. He's got no friends. Snape? Yeah. Yeah, Snape doesn't have any friends. Just Poor Lily. Man. Just Lily and Mulsaber. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's what I mean. Poor dude. He's got no friends. No one wants to hang out with him. That's terrible. Let's see. Alright, so what I think I'm going to need to do, I might have to stop the stream and just uh, restart my computer, because for some reason Discord doesn't want to open. I don't open as administrator or anything. Well... I will be here. Try one more thing. If we have to you stop and restart. Run a message. No, well, I'm not. We're just running into some technical issues. Sure, I could do that. We do want to talk about Stephen King. <clears throat> All right. Well, I let them know. So let's just see what happens. All right. Nothing. Not a thing. So now what? Oh, so now, hold tight, everyone. We will be right back. I just have to restart my computer. Everybody will be...
willing to pop in. Yeah, I just I want to make sure this worked how I did it. Okay, it does work. Nice. So I could actually stop streaming with the software, but it doesn't end the stream. So that's cool. Oh, okay. Because I have to end the stream on the site. So, okay, now it's working. So I can hop in here and we can get everything ready. And Are people still checking us out? Yeah. They didn't leave us. Oh, all right. Oh, look. We've got people in the general thing saying hi. Look at all of those people in here. Oh, yes. See how often I check the general? Whoa, that's terrible. Yeah, because uh, some of these I'm really excited to talk about that we read in Stephen King this week. Oh, some of them were juicy. I think you know which one. Green and juicy. Oh, yeah, yeah. And, oh, hello, Noel. Give us one second. We can't hear you just yet. I got to plug in my headphones. Oh yeah, oh my gosh. I gotta pay more attention to the to the Discord. There's people in here saying things. I'm a terrible person. Alright. We should be able to okay. hear you now. Yes, hear you. Can you hear us? Alright, cool. God, I need to turn this off. It's weird. Okay, there we go. All right. All right. Okay. I got to get into Stephen King mode now. Clunk. There we go. Always so complicated. Hello. We finally made it. Yep. We were early last time, now we're late. Lola! Lola! Oh my gosh. Alright. Go do that over there. So, how you been, Noel? Enjoying... Me too. Lucky you too. I don't. You get Black Friday off. Yeah, that's true. We uh we give off we give up uh Veterans Day so that we can get Black Friday off after Thanksgiving. Which is nice. I'll take that trade any day. I'm just glad we get Juneteenth off next year too. <laughs> I looked at the holiday schedule and almost all the big holidays are all on a Monday. Let's just hope this coming spring isn't a strawberry spring. <laughs> I'd rather have a banana winter if it were up to me. I don't know what that is. Is that a thing? I don't know. Okay. It is now. I just made it up. <laughs> it's a banana winter. You call it a banana summer when it's so hot that you burn and peel a lot. This, I no, I made it up. It's okay, banana, banana winter. winter. Banana winter. Um, you so can have avocado summer. I guess. Uh, I guess I gotta, I gotta just get this out here. I didn't really enjoy this story that much. I was a little disappointed with it. Which. 
I was um, going to say, would you care to elaborate <laughs> about that? Oh, oh you did? Um, I, I just felt like it was very, very straightforward. It was a basic story. And, uh, I guess the thing that really turned me off was like, it was like the second page. I was just like, yep, he's the killer. I know it. And it turns out he's the killer. That killed it for me. Too. And there wasn't, there wasn't a lot of mystery to it. I guess that's the biggest thing. There was no mystery. You know, the whole time I'm going through, I'm like, he's the killer. Otherwise... Unless, like, Stephen King pulls a whole Stephen King thing and it's, like, some, uh... Monster. Yeah, super, mist monster. supernatural being or something like that that's killing all these people. But outside of that, I really didn't see, see anything happening. You mean like the descriptions of the weather and the fog and walking through in the night and all that? Oh yeah, one hundred percent. I think uh, the writing was great. I just think uh, <sighs> creatively, it didn't live up to Stephen King. I guess. Oh no, you can't hear Noel. Hold on, hold on. Maybe it's because Bailey won't shut up. Sorry. Sorry. Oh, um, I see. I didn't switch over the, uh, okay, there we go. No, no. Noel you... should be heard. Oh, can you hear me now? Yeah. yeah that's better. Now it's picking it up. Yeah. Oh my God. Uh... Bailey. This, this was a good story. Good, but not great. Uh, I also got some Ted Bundy vibes from this one. Some, yeah, definitely like serial killer vibes. No, Ted Bundy specifically. Ted Bundy specific? Yeah. Oh, how so? Murdering young ladies on college campuses. Mm hmm He did decapitate somebody. He bludgeoned people in the head. Oh. You know. Okay. Did so you guys like... look up the real case of spring Heel Jack? No. No. Didn't know there was one. Yeah. Um again, Stephen King seems to know a lot about weird weird stuff. And I guess uh um what was his name? Spring Hill Jack. He was like an ancient mythological like look up his there's a whole Wikipedia about him. It was pretty interesting. Spring Hill Spring Hill Jack. Interesting. I mean <laughs> like like a cryptozoology thing where he's like a uh, different kind of creature. I don't know. I see him. That's... He he looks kind of like Batman. <laughs> Wait, what? Oh, okay. That's the picture. Oh, all right. I thought he was a, like a like real serial killer back in the day or something. Well, I think there were a series of killings, but they were attributed to this creature. Ah, and so... gotcha. It kind of became a legend, kind of like Jack the Ripper. Um, but, I mean, how do you know about this? That's my question. Who knows about spring Heel Jack and decides to write it into a story? Stephen just... King. Yeah. Someone who majored in writing. <laughs> and enjoys serial killers. And, I mean, Stephen King grew up in, like, the, the time of serial killers when serial killers was, like, the thing. Well, he wasn't, he didn't grow up then, but he was certainly writing then. The 80s was like the serial killer era. He was a well-established author at that point. Yeah. Okay, fair enough. I don't know. I remember I did see something recently where it was like, you know, you want to stop serial killers? Stop giving them cool names. Start giving them, like, lousy names. Wasn't that in like, a story we read? Was it? Wasn't that in I a thought story? It was an, I thought it was an article. Maybe it was. Was it? 
Like, stop calling them Night Stalker and all that stuff. Was it in one of the stories? I thought I read it in an article. Because I looked up a couple articles. Because there's, um, like, right now in, uh, I think, Utah or something. Or I, I can't remember where it's. Somewhere in the U.S., there's a bunch of killings that are happening, and they they're starting to attribute it to one person, saying that there's a serial killer on the loose. Oh, well. So I kind of looked into that, and then I got down this whole serial killer slope the other day. So it all kind of blurs. It's it's Stephen King, and then real life. It's, it's, it's all there. Well, I'm. You guys go ahead. I'm going to get back. Okay. Yeah. I can't focus. I'm sorry. Bailey's barking so much. I can't even think. Um, no worries. It's, I think yeah. I think the biggest bummer for me with the story was just, it wasn't that the story was terrible. The story was poorly written. It was none of that. It was just, I figured it out too quickly. And then I was just like, oh, okay. Yep. He's got a girl's head in his trunk or something. Yeah. I thought it was a good story, but you know. Like, last week we were talking about a story about uh, trucks killing people. Now we're just yeah. on basic serial killer story. It's like, I think he should have ordered them differently. If this was, like, the first uh, story in there, and then he worked up to, like, murdering trucks, or the next story we're about to talk about, uh, I think that would have been better. But, you know, you have all these great stories before, and then you have your basic run-of-the-mill serial killer story. It just, I yeah. think that's the only reason. He needs to write Banana Winter now. Yeah. Yep. Or maybe you can. I'll write Banana Winter. It's strawberry Spring, like, fanfic. Banana it Winter. Sounds like a mixed drink. Banana Winter. It sounds like a, some kind of a mixed drink or something. That does. That, that could, maybe I'll have to invent great. that. Yeah. Make the Banana Winter. Shaken, not stirred. <laughs> uh, what should, should we move on to the next story? The next story. Yeah, we can talk about the next story because I got issues with the next this, story. This next story oh. was straight up Stephen King at his like grittiest and nastiest. It was so messed up. And maybe that's why he put that story in there before because it was like you have this run of the mill story and then like one of the most disturbing stories so far, for me at least. Yeah, this I, was a doozy for sure. I just personally just felt so uncomfortable reading this one just because uh, Stephen King is very good at playing on all of our fears, right? So what's my fear? Heights, right? I can't handle heights. And then just thinking about this guy on this on this ledge, just, you know, walking around a building i just no oh wait i messed up i was talking about the story after this i forgot the ledge was next what? i was i was thinking lawnmower man was next then the ledge you're you're okay. all over i did place like today. the ledge too i did like this one too you can't get the discord to work you can't get the audio to work now you can't we, talk about the story for some reason it's uh, Bailey won't stop barking. Everything's messed up tonight. Okay, we're talking about the ledge. The ledge. That's the story. I did like this one too. I really like this. One. I did not see where this was going. That's for sure. Yeah, this one had a pretty cool concept. Felt scary. You know, felt like, like you said, you get that sense of vertigo. You know, you're when he's walking around the building. It's like. He's gonna fall on that pigeon that keeps pecking at his leg. Um, oh, so he had nothing to hang on to. He just literally had to shuffle across. Shuffle across, like on the balls of his feet. No. Yeah. That's, Sorry, that's... Marsha. You're not worth it. You're not worth it. Yeah, not to me. This was very. This was a very high concept one, I think. No, 100%. And um, I don't know. The whole time I was thinking that um, that he was going to like get around the ledge and then Martha was going to be there and, you know, she's alive. And Marsha. Marsha is there and she just like 
pushes him off the ledge or something like that but no that didn't happen she was just dead but i still liked where it went like he sends uh the guy out on the ledge and he's just like you may keep your deals but i might not yeah i might well she well shout on you yeah i was glad he got the upper hand in the end oh 100 percent he was like, no, now it's your turn. That was great. I'm used to those feel good endings in Stephen King, so it like caught me off guard. Like, oh, the good guy won. Well, I guess kind of good guy. But... He seemed like he was kind of a loser. Yeah, but he was kind of a loser. Still, you know, he he got the upper hand on the mafia guy. Yeah, I'd say it's a win. It was a win for me in my book. I mean, I like the story. It's one of the few Stephen King stories I've read where I've actually been like. Oh, jeez. I'm uncomfortable. I can't. Nope. High things. Nope. Mm Mm-mm. Yeah, and there's something about this story where his struggle makes you root for him. Don't you think? Like, because he has to do this impossible thing, it makes you kind of invest in him, even if he's not the greatest, greatest guy out there. Yeah, because the task he has to undergo is so incredible and difficult. Yeah. And you're just, oh, you're just sitting there going, oh, come on, dude, you can do it. You can do it. You're so close. You can do it. It reminded me of that scene in The Matrix where Neo has to go across the ledge. Oh, yeah. (laughs) Yeah. That was like what I pictured in my mind's eye at first was that scene where he's out there on the ledge. Oh yeah, and he tells him to go around and go up to the roof. He's like, "No way, I'm not doing this." Yep. Yeah. Um, and and then he does it anyway. <laughs> yeah, and it was nice to see the villain of this story kind of get get his just desserts. He he has to go out there on the ledge. Get his come on. Make it. Yeah, it was great. I loved it. You don't get that a lot in Stephen King. No. That's like... I I was happy, especially after that next one. This one just caught me off guard. Yeah, I don't know. I enjoyed that. I thought Kressner was a great character. He was described well. He was very much everything you would think he would be. And of course, he has a henchman named Tony. Hey, you have to. Either that or a henchman named Tiny. Tiny. (laughs) You just gotta... Uh, and then, well, do we have anything else to say about this one? I'm excited for the next one. I thought we were going to talk about the next one during this one, so. You just want to talk about this one very badly. Yes, I do. (laughs) This was. Well, does Noel have any other thoughts? Oh, no, I'm, I'm ready to move on to, uh, to this, this one. This one. (laughs) (laughs) Was wild. I, mean, I think this one was my favorite of the five. I'm just yeah, gonna, it, I know we should wait until the end to say, but no, no, it's okay because I'll say right now this is my favorite too, hands down. Um, it was just so bizarre. I mean, so surreal and twisted and twisted in like a visual way. Yeah, it's just the, the way he creates images in the stories just. I just really like that. I love how he described the bits of grass and stuff in the guy's teeth and everything as being hairy. Yeah. That was a great descriptor there. Um, And I don't know, I'm just picturing a cloven hood naked fat man like around in someone's yard eating the grass. Like, and what? Monks or squirrels? What was it? Mole. It was mole. a mole. A mole, yeah. Yeah, oh, oh. Also, Phoenix song for the Smith's cat that got killed. Yeah, Phoenix song for the Smith's cat. That, that was gross. That was sad. The beginning. I've never done that. I remember one time I ran over a frog when I was mowing the lawn. I felt terrible about it. So it's, it's awful. It's I've awful. never run over an animal mowing the lawn. Other than like an insect or something I, I couldn't see, I've never run over an animal mowing the lawn. Um, it, be happy. It's, it's awful. 
But I will. I do have a story to go along with this story. Okay. So this story really hit home for me because it was the day you couldn't walk on lunch. So I decided to throw on the audiobook and listen to this story while I walked on my lunch at work. And I'm walking around and <laughs> it's like it's, just, it's around the point where it's describing the guy like naked going across the lawn eating the grass when I walk past this house where this guy is mowing the grass and I get like the whiff of the cut grass which normally smells really good but I got like that whiff and then it's talking about it and then I started to like taste cut grass because <laughs> like many people I spent a lot of my early years as a dumb child and I definitely tried grass one or two times look cows my dog would I've eat it every grass. now and then so. i've eaten grass it's fine so yeah i was listening to this and i got the smell the taste of cut grass in my mouth and i just i had to pause it because my stomach just couldn't handle it i'm gonna just give it like five or ten minutes before i started listening to it <laughs> That's funny. i got like fully immersed into this story uh, yeah so Yes. So, oh, go ahead. So it's Pan is operating a lawnmower business? Yeah, yeah. And murdering people who aren't cool with... With their methods. Yeah. 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 Their way of doing business. I just... A sacrifice must be made in the birdbath. The sacrifice must be made, but yes... Um. Also, what do you think was in the birdbath? It's his parts of his body. He got ran over by a lawnmower. There's chunks everywhere, I'm sure. Yeah, That's you think? I, what do you think happens? When, well, well, look at what happens to the grass. It gets eaten up and then it gets out the side. It's just the same thing with the dude's body. Well, yeah, but he was talking about a sacrifice in the birdbath. And then they, he asks, you know, where's the rest of them? And he says, in the bird bath. And he goes and looks, and he gets, like, sick. And he's like, yeah, I say he was, like, a sex fiend or something like that. I don't know. Maybe his pee-pee was in the bird bath. That's what I'm thinking. Did he, like, castrate him and throw his, you know, bits? His penis and balls? This is a family show. It is not a family is... show. Okay. The man got ran over by a lawnmower. That is not... And Grandma got run over by a reindeer. But that's a reindeer. That's not a lawnmower. <laughs> Besides, Grandma was fine afterwards. Grandma as far got as I trampled. She was not fine. By a, single, by a single reindeer. It wasn't like she got ran over by all of them and the sled. Yeah, it's like how people do goat yoga. Yo you know? What? <laughs> We've talked about goat yoga before. There's a thing where people let goats walk on their back, and it's like goat yoga. So maybe I bet you guys. Santa does like reindeer yoga. Yeah, maybe it's reindeer yoga. Maybe they do that in Norway. Reindeer yoga. Maybe. That's, <laughs> That's yeah. weird. Maybe Kristoff and Sven do reindeer yoga. I guess, I guess it would be kind of nice, though. Clippity cloppity. Pulled a Theon on him. Pulled a Theon on him. <laughs> I like how most of the clients were okay with it or didn't call the cops at least. I, I right? mean, well, I feel like most if it were me, okay, if it were me and I hired Pan to mow my lawn and he's out there just eating the grass naked, I would probably think this is a little weird, but I don't think I'd call the cops. <laughs> just be like I'm not calling him again. Yeah, I probably but... just not call again, and then you know, probably would just keep very polite and maybe you know say, "Oh yeah, God bless the grass." Yeah, that's good. Yeah. God bless the grass. Have a nice day. Um, yeah, I yeah. like how in this story, Harold, the main character, you know, he he seems pretty normal. But then when the lawnmower man starts doing crazy stuff, he just flip, flips out. Like, he just loses. It's like he was on a very short fuse or something because he just freaks out. I mean, I guess anyone would freak out. But I don't know. This felt yeah. like a, a 
a very primal, like, I'm losing my mind type thing. So I, that was kind of cool. Well, he was also like a uh, upstanding Republican suburban citizen. Yeah, like, right. I know. Living in a cul-de-sac somewhere, probably like, there's a naked fat man mowing my lawn, eating the grass. The neighbors are going to see. I can't. He's Vernon Dursley, is what it is. Yeah, pretty oh, much. Oh man, what would Vernon Dursley do if uh, if this guy came to his house? I also just want to point out that I'm not sure. He probably. Uh-huh shove harry in the cupboard because he probably thinks that he's one of harry's freaky friends um in the book misery by stephen king there is also an instance of a lawnmower yep yep yeah, I don't have to say anything else nope i know there is a lawnmower situation in that book i yep so far, what I'm getting from this book is like it's, if nothing else, it's great to read because it seems like all the little seeds are being planted for his further uh, his further works. There's a lot. Well, you had a reference to uh, the stand. Refer- the whole story. You you found the reference to it. There been a few. I think yep. you said there was a Dark Tower reference in here. And Probably. now, and now there's another one like misery. Oh misery. god, the lawnmower. Poor Buster. Um, yeah, I always found that a very memorable. <laughs> in that book, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, um, was it this story? No, was it the last story? Somebody got sick with the flu. In one of the stories. Somebody mentions, oh, so-and-so was really sick with the flu. Might have been a Asian flu or something. Oh. Oh, okay. Yeah. What story was that? It was one of the stories we just read. Yeah, yeah, I know. I, I thought, I couldn't remember if it was The Ledge or Strawberry Spring. I think it was Strawberry Spring. Maybe. Yeah, because somebody had the flu. College campus, that probably yeah. was it. Yeah. Somebody had really bad flu, and I was like, was it Captain Trips? Was it Captain Trips? <laughs> Maybe that's uh, the beginning of... Well, we know how... Those of us that have read The Stand, we know how it got out. But um, I don't know. I was just always like, oh, maybe maybe that was Captain Trips. <laughs> Before everybody knew what it was. Ugh. Oh. Maybe. Yeah, I don't know. I love this story. It was like the shortest story we read, but it was just... Wow, just it was it's a so lot bizarre. Of Stephen King. This is what I expect with Stephen King. This is I think this is what you like out of Stephen King. Yeah, I mean either that or uh or you know something like seriously like scary. Jerusalem plot, plot kind of yeah. thing. Yeah. I just I liked the Lawnmower Man story. I also liked how the main character describes the the lawnmower man and how he looks like the construction workers and all those blue collar guys who secretly really scare him. Yeah. <laughs> because he's an upstanding suburbanite all Republican. The libs. the libs. He's a Republican that doesn't even understand the stock market. Come on. Yeah. yeah right. Loser. <laughs> yeah, this was a fun one for sure. I found it very fun to read and oh yeah ledge was like ledge was exciting but it was very like cold and calculating yeah i felt like lawnmower man is just like almost like a warm insane it's like a warm insanity i don't know it's like you feel like you're going crazy but you feel happy i don't understand i can't describe it it uh oh jeez You, you pulled it out of my ear i didn't do anything I didn't do anything. Uh, it was just felt like a wild, surrealistic ride into Crazy Town. And I like that very much. 100%. Let's get freaky with it. Like, let's go to Funky Town. We went to Funky Town. Yeah, we did. 
Uh, and it kind of stays up there a little bit with the next one, Quitters Inc. Well, this story was very much like supernatural wild, and then the story pre- previous was very much like human evil. Yeah. Totally different things. But yeah. But yeah. Quitters Inc. Still so many next questions. Story. How about the lawnmower man? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Was the lawnmower man possessed by the possessed lawnmower, or did he possess the lawnmower and he was in control, or like? But Pan runs the business. Yeah, yeah it's Pan's running the show. It's yeah. So many questions for that one. What's Pan's motivation? To eat people. He's not. He probably yeah. just. He probably just uh, is a big fan of croquet. That's what I'm thinking. I don't know. I don't know. I just... Lots of questions. Anyway, maybe we should move on to the next story. Quitters, Inc. Quitters, Inc. Yeah. Yes. That's one way to stop yourself from smoking. Somehow, I knew it was going to reach this point with this story. I was like... Oh, it's foolproof. You'll quit, guaranteed. Yada yada yada. I'm thinking, yeah, they're they're definitely gonna kidnap his family. Yep. Yeah. When I started reading, and as soon as he gets the card, and he's like, "It's guaranteed," but we can't talk about your methods. I was like, "Yep, they're gonna be torturing his family, threatening his family. People are gonna like lose body parts or something. Like it's gonna be uh, using the people you love." to blackmail you into quitting and then if you go above a certain weight yeah jesus i know yeah there's no freedoms after signing that contract well because a lot of people who smoke then they gain a lot of weight once they quit right i guess it looks bad on them you know well they can have other health problems you're making a a healthy choice to quit smoking and then you're going to end up with what diabetes afterwards how successful is quitters inc then in that case yeah i feel like once you lose the weight and you stay like the weight loss stays then there's something else that you have to do or else they're gonna punish your family i feel like it just keeps going yeah yeah like a deal with the devil where you could never get away exactly well i mean they even say it like was it the first year they have like every so many months it flops back and forth. Then after the first year, they just check on you periodically. It could be one day a year, or it could be once every month a year, or whatever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Crazy. Yeah, I like how they they use the term audit. They're like, oh, we're gonna yeah. audit you every year or yep. something. All and... the terms are very business like and clinical. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. And, and the uh, bad guy in the story reminded me of Mr. Burns for some reason. I don't know really? why. <laughs> Mr. Burns. I didn't uh, picture Mr. Burns, but that's pretty yeah, funny. No. That's pretty great, because now I'm picturing could, it in my head. I could kind of see it. <laughs> you know? Yes, Mr. Simpson. <laughs> Uh, it just really sucked that like he had a kid with disabilities and they threatened his kid with disabilities and it was messed up that they threatened his kid with disabilities and then all of a sudden out of nowhere because they threaten his kid he becomes more involved with his kid yeah and loves him more so in some way it's weird that it works well it's like a whole statement about how their um uh, almost system creating a a very strict morality code through threat of violence you're going to quit smoking and then you're going to be an ideal weight and then you're going to do this and this and then via these control mechanisms people actually do become more successful treat their family members better Mm -hmm. um but you shouldn't need the threat of all of that in order to do 
those things. Well, no, but I think it's kind of a play on the whole uh, you don't know what you have till it's gone type thing. You take you it for take granted it unless for it's granted. threatened. Yeah. 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 That could be part of it. Like he doesn't want to admit that he has this son with disabilities, but... Because maybe threat. he's embarrassed yeah. about it or whatever, because there's a stigma. But you threaten to kill him or take him away, all of a sudden he's just like, no. Yeah, because it's still his son. It's just very interesting. And then the ending on this was another perfect Stephen King ending, I think. The way he's just like, her hand felt weird. Oh yeah, he was missing the tip of her pinky. Yeah, she was missing. She was missing a whole finger, wasn't oh, yeah, she? She was missing yeah, the whole, uh, whole finger. Yeah, yeah. He went above yeah, weight. Just... That fool. <laughs> um, this story has one of my favorite tropes, which is like the evil corporation, right? Yeah. Like, yeah. we're like a business. We're, you know, we ostensibly provide a function. People, we have clients. We're it's all above board but they're evil somehow. Like, they have these weird abilities to do whatever they want, and, like, no one can stop them. And, mm -hmm. You know, yeah. I got that vibe from Quitters, Inc. I was like, wow, this is like the CIA or something. Like, oh, yeah. I mean, if we want to dive into yeah. it, I think it's definitely, like, uh, big business and corporations and how they kind of control moves, even when you don't know that they're doing it. Because it, yeah, it kind of is more... So, I mean, this just became more true as the story aged because now, you know, everything's online. And corporations have more power and ability than ever before. Very true. So, yeah, Good I definitely, point. I can definitely see that. The whole um, big business, you know, the man is watching you at all times. Big brother. Yeah. Kind of a thing. But they're all so much happier mm -hmm. at the end of the story. They're all so happy. I think it's also Stephen King having a little resentment at quitting, too. Oh, you know? maybe it's personal. You know, Because he talks about in the beginning of the book that he was trying to quit. Yeah. That, you know, he was smoking, he was trying to quit. So I feel like it could be something like that, too. Maybe. Stephen King's know. personal like, uh, journey to quitting. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's like what you mentioned about you shouldn't, it shouldn't take this threat for you to be involved with your family and love your kids. And it shouldn't, you shouldn't have to feel like, I, I don't know what I'm saying. I'm just agreeing with what you were saying earlier. <laughs> All right, we'll agree with that. That kind of but, morality shouldn't yeah. have to be legislated in that way. But yeah, at the same weird. time, yeah. humans are so horrible that maybe that is what it takes for some people. Yeah, I don't that's... think they're necessarily so horrible. I think it's that we have trouble. Uh, we tend to focus on the things we don't have and not so much on the things we do have that are important. Fair, so, like. Fair. In the beginning, he's kind of obsessing about quitting, but then after he goes through everything to quit, he's like, wow, you know, I thought I wanted it, now I don't. Now I really he just, don't. He wants the freedom and his family back. Right. Type thing. Put it in perspective. Yeah. 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 I don't pretty, know. This is a good story. Pretty, I'd say this is a pretty good one. I do too. This was definitely a good story. I don't think it held up to the lawnmower man, though. Lawnmower man still leaves my shard. Does anyone? Does anything? I think this week's favorite is going to be unanimous. Just e saying. <laughs> so let's discuss well, our we'll final story. Yeah, the last one. But yes, Ken, the final story. I know what I you know, need. I know what you need. This was so creepy at times. I definitely felt like creeped out in some passages of the story. It was, yeah. I I got the vibe that this was Stephen King does a stalker story with a little bit of a supernatural Stephen King like twist, but this definitely felt like Stephen King does stalker. Yeah. Story. Yeah. 
and it was so long. I think the thing that was so scary about it was it was mostly like real. Like this stuff happens, you know. Yeah, people get gaslit like that. And, yeah, and manipulated like that, and people get stalked like that. Stalked and... since the first grade. Oh God, that was. Jeez, man. Oh man, that's like uh that's that's one thing that scares me is that kind of level of obsession like if you're that obsessed Mm -hmm. over anything it doesn't matter what your target of that is it's like just that raw obsession is really freaky to me it's like how do people convince themselves to do stuff you know you know what i'm saying like i don't know yeah how do they convince themselves like yeah i should do this or how do they not know like well, you know, maybe keeping her hair for 30 years is kind of creepy. I guess it wasn't 30 years. It was only 10 years, so I guess it's okay, but... Right, but what kind of mechanism do you have set up in your brain that that becomes acceptable behavior? Right. Like, what delusions are you operating under Yeah. that that's acceptable behavior? Yeah. Yeah, that's freaky. That that kind of obsession or delirium, like you said, that just makes things seem different. You know, like maybe you literally, I you literally lose your ability to perceive reality to a certain degree yeah. or or boundaries. Mm-hmm. Boundaries and were not observed, observed in this story. No. no. But like but, the fact that he could see the future, you know, like he could make things happen for people around him. Yeah. Um, this had a kind of um, but he Danny didn't... Danny Torrance uh, dead zone uh, yep. character with psychic abilities uh, vibe to it, but not used in a positive way. Right. Which brings up the question, though, because he does have that psychic ability. How did he not know that she was going to break into it? Oh, goodness. You know, let's punch some holes into this story. There are no holes in this story. How did he not know? Wouldn't he have known? Did he want her to... He's not Professor Trelawney. He doesn't know everything that's going to happen in the future. Trelawney knows nothing. Trelawney knows a lot of stuff. She did actually kill everything. All of her predictions were right in one way or another. I mean, this guy was pretty much right in every way. I don't think he so much could predict the entire future so much as he had some psychic abilities to where he could manipulate things to happen in someone's favor. Yeah. Well, he also had the voodoo dolls, so maybe he had to have the voodoo dolls in order to do it. Yeah. I think this was a story where I liked the concept of he could alter the future or or somehow like alter probability or something like that Mm -hmm. but again it was kind of like the um what was it the sometimes they come back story where yeah demon ritual at the end Mm -hmm. it's like oh now he's got like voodoo dolls and he's got weird creepy books in his closet and i was like but he's already got this psychic ability like yeah, this this instance of using that like crazy voodoo magic type stuff to end the story, it, it worked with it. Like sometimes mm-hmm. they come back, it felt really forced in, but in this one, I could believe it. Like everything else kind of adds up. It wasn't mm-hmm. just all of a sudden he whips out a book and performs some spell on her to get her to fall in love with him or something like that. I think the objects enhance his ability. Okay. Potentially, or enables him to use his ability on specific people. It's like he has her hair and makes a little doll of her so he can then focus his ability on her. Because, I mean, he did kill her boyfriend. Yeah. Yeah. So maybe the object component is part of maybe how it, it maybe intensifies his ability. Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah. That makes sense. I could see that. Also, it's kind of like a tangent, but I think the story was kind of Stephen King's take on um, 
rape in a new light. You know, you think rape is just like forced sex with someone, but they made a point to say that she never slept with him. And you can still technically rape someone and just it is it's emotional and mental manipulating someone against their yeah. will you know yeah. which he does and yeah, i think it was kind of stephen king's subvert like a coercion deep dive. You know, like coercion is basically like the rape of your mental like you know it's like any anything like that betrayal anything like that mm-hmm. that's kind of like a here's what it is yeah He's made you love him by knowing every secret thing you want and need, and that's not love at all. That's rape. Yeah, exactly. Um, <clears throat> which where would Elizabeth be without Alice? First of all, Raped. Alice. Al- Alice figured this all out. She. The yeah. whole argument is that he's manipulated you into loving him. He. Yeah. You haven't naturally fallen in love yeah. with him. He's manufactured this whole situation almost like stockholm syndrome without the kidnapping yeah 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 um i thought it was a very deep story like out of all the stories i feel like this one definitely carried like the heaviest message behind it you know i think you can look at this as a story about women who do potentially get gaslighted or manipulated into a situation and uh elizabeth had somebody there to kind of show her what the f was going on and she could get out of it Mm -hmm. um but then even at the end of the story she goes wow am i really that am i really that shallow do i really only want and need these really superficial things and she ends up kind of questioning herself at the very the very end of the story she doesn't walk away from it necessarily feeling empowered or anything she walks away from it feeling very uh disturbed i think and upset and then also questioning herself Mm -hmm. but i think that again carries over with the whole uh idea of rape aspect and the victim being traumatized from it yeah yeah you know it doesn't have to be a physical thing it can just be mental and It can still have everlasting consequences after that. Yeah, she's been emotionally and mentally traumatized. Bless you. Oh, excuse me. Maybe I am getting a cold. Maybe. I was going to say, you've been kind of stuffy tonight. I've been a little stuffy tonight. But yeah, I don't know. I like this story. With the whole, like, werewolf nightmare, I thought he was going to... Maybe at first I was like, is he going to be a werewolf at the end? He's going to eat her? Is this some Red Riding Hood shit happening right now? <laughs> yeah, I was expecting a more like uh, superstitious type ending where he's like just straight up the devil or uh, a werewolf or something like that. Maybe a vampire, you know? I feel like that would have worked because vampires have that ability to just lure any woman home with them. Well, not just any woman. The one with the tastiest blood. Can they smell it? How do they gauge that? What? Tastiest blood. <laughs> maybe, maybe some vampires. I bet prefer... it's like a perfume thing where it's like you know how you go to the mall and you, they spray different perfumes on you and stuff. It's like that with blood. I bet. Maybe. Are, are there like vintages? Oh, this O negative is delicious. I have a feeling maybe different ones have different flavors. Listen, I started writing a book about vampires at one point when I was a kid, and I really got into the whole flavors and different food products and stuff. With I blood. remember this. Is this the yeah. one with the veggie vamps? Yeah, there was the well, vamps. there was one vegetarian vampire character, Benicula, oh, okay. and he had a he uh had a skin condition that his skin was so sensitive to the rays of the sun that he couldn't even go out at nighttime because of the light from the moon would would give him moon burn. <laughs> I forgot that part. That's cool. And no, then he I also viewed the anything. drinking of human blood as being a cruel and inhuman practice, so he just he sucked the juice out of uh tomatoes. Yeah, vegetables. Blood orange. 
Yeah. He claimed that he could get the same nutrients out of the vegetables, but he was very skinny and anemic looking and no one really bought into it. Well, I mean... He took some supplements, too. Blood is mostly like iron and protein, so... I mean, you could definitely... You know, spinach, there you go. And I think broccoli... That, and isn't it true that we've never synthesized blood in a laboratory? Like, we can't create blood? Isn't that true? I don't know. I don't know for sure, but I do know we can grow muscle now, so I want to say that we definitely have done blood. Wow. That'd be quite a but, feat. Yeah. Maybe not, though. I don't know. I don't know about blood. But I know they've done muscle. But either way, I'm just wondering if, if vampires can, like, smell your blood on you and, and like, they, like, walk by and they go... Ugh. diabetic not feeling that <laughs> do not want but then another diabetic vampire was like, like oh Ooh, diabetic. No, 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 diabetic love that that's got that sweet flavor to it <laughs> diabetic it. i'll save you for dessert it's right like you no know? I, I don't know questions maybe i need to go back into my uh my novel and explore that a little bit R write write more up on that rewrite the story bring back eager the vegetarian vampire. Here we yeah. go. Go ahead. No, I won't spoil any more of the story. Oh, it's you, an original read story. It for the channel. If I rewrite it, maybe. <laughs> I don't know. We'll see. Dual Siphon versus the Seventeenth was my villain. That was the bad guy's oh, name. What was he called? What was he called? Dual Siphon worth the Seventeenth. Uh, oh, that's great. It's the seventeenth right. in a long, long line of of monarchs. I was gonna try to think of a segue, but I can't think of one. His older so sister's just... pissed off at him because she's the firstborn, and she thought she should be uh, able to take the throne. But um, so she was she was not born with a penis, so therefore she could not rule the vampire kingdom. That's terrible for her. That's a bummer. But which story do you think should take the throne this evening? Lawnmower Man. <laughs> Hands down. I just wanted to double check. Lawnmower Man. I that story know. was the best story in the bunch. Yeah. Lawnmower Man. Do, do I even need to ask Lowell? No. Lowell. No, no. Noel. I already said. Yeah, for sure. It was just so bizarre. I just <laughs> loved reading it. I was just uh i just loved how things escalated in this story so, so quickly, quickly. <laughs> um, like at one second he's like okay he's kind of a weird guy but he's gonna mow my lawn i can't be too upset like two seconds later he's naked he's <laughs> eating the grass the lawnmower is running by itself and harold just loses his mind immediately and then he gets sacrificed in a bird bath what is not to love about this story? We haven't even gotten to Pan or the fact that the guy is a satyr and he's got right. cloven hooves Feet, and yeah. his pubic hair is green. Oh, I forgot about oh, yeah, that. That's right. That they specifically mentioned that. So he had green pubic yeah. hair. I forgot uh, about that. Oh my god, yeah. Uh, you can almost picture Will Ferrell just standing as a neighbor on the porch just saying, that escalated quickly. <laughs> oh, I thought you were gonna say Will Ferrell is the lawnmower man. <laughs> oh no, Jesus, no! <laughs> oh God, no! No, Will, please. <laughs> Wait, that's actually perfect <coughs> casting. Yeah, yeah. I mean, he probably would play that part too. He'd probably be down for it. I don't want to see Will Ferrell with green pubic hair. <laughs> I just don't want that in my life. <laughs> Oh, man. No, but I mean, yeah, hands down, this story went from 0 to 180 in like a page. It was, I think it was the shortest story out of our set of five. And just, dear God, so much. Just, it was just all, it, it just happened all at once. I wasn't ready for it. I was like, oh, okay, we got this suburbanite guy. He likes to watch the Red Sox and drink beer. Okay. <laughs> 
Yeah. Talks about his daughter going on dates and blah, blah, blah. All right. And then the lawnmower man shows up and he's like, I like the Yankees. And you're just like, okay, okay. Oh, my God. <laughs> All of a sudden, it just the story just rips open. <laughs> like, boom. Oh. I just, wow. Uh, yeah, that's. Yeah. We were talking about it. No subtlety there whatsoever. No, no slow build up. No, no drama. No suspense. I wonder how much Nothing. return business they get. Like how many people are like, his methods are weird. Yeah, but my lawn looks great. <laughs> you know, I don't know because Harold, before Harold was like all ready to accept it. Um. Because he wasn't going to have to rake up any of the grass after. Yeah, that's true. He was almost he was almost there. Almost there. Yeah, yeah, I probably would have just shut up. Like, The man just went out and is eating grass naked on my lawn. If he's crazy enough to do that, what, what else will he do? Be right. <laughs> it's like... Uh, let, let the neighbor call the cops. I'm not calling the cops. <laughs> it's like the easiest way to uh, win a fight. They start throwing hands, just... Drop your pants and get naked. <laughs> <laughs> what are they gonna do? I mean, nothing. Why'd it's you like... get naked? They don't know. <laughs> you probably don't know either. <laughs> well, it's like the classic thing of, like, don't tell me how to do my job, right? Like, if I'm the lawnmower man, I'm doing my thing. I'm getting naked. I'm eating grass. <laughs> Someone comes up to me and says, "Stop." <laughs> what? You don't tell me how to do what I do. <laughs> <laughs> like, I'm cutting your grass, bro. What's the problem? What more do you I need? guess the only thing I would say you, you is like... The mess you would have to rake. What's the issue? I guess the only thing I would be like is like, dude, just don't poop on my lawn and we're cool. <laughs> do you need a diaper or something? Like, what's? Why do you need the pants off? <laughs> That is the thing. Why does he need to be naked? He can't eat the grass in clothes? He doesn't want to get grass stains on his clothes. Well, maybe he should wear green pants next time. Maybe the he's he's chunky. Maybe the pants are restrictive and he can't like get down on his hands and knees as maybe easily. He sees, maybe since he's a satyr, he sees wearing human clothes as kind of like a nuisance. Like he doesn't really want to. So. Uh. Whenever he gets the chance, he just takes takes it off. <laughs> That's he, it. He wants to be comfortable while he eats lunch. Yeah, right. He's kind of doing like a, a pan is associated with like nature, right? Yeah, I think so, so. He's trying to be one with nature in his natural uh, state, eating the grass. Maybe I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> I'm I, I do think it's funny so far in the group of uh chapters, chapters we've chosen, we've chosen not chapters, chapters stories we've chosen so the first one we all chose something different i chose jerusalem's lot you chose graveyard shift and you chose i am the doorway and the next time me and you both chose boogeyman yeah you chose trucks and now we just all agree hands so down yeah, Lawnmower yeah. man. Yeah. Best this was story. quite I would say this group of five, each story was very eclectic and had its own weird thing about it. So mm -hmm. I could have I liked them all, but to me the lawnmower man was just the weirdest. <laughs> That's why I like I think I liked it the best. Me too. It was just so so out there. So I just want to ask real quick. You don't have to tell me what story it is yet, because we still have five more to go. But out of the stories we've read so far, do you have one favorite yet? Like, have you figured it out? Because we're going to choose, like, our favorite story out of the entire book in the end. Right. Have you, ha have you had that one where you're just like, I don't know if anything could beat this. I want to choose this one. You know, I... Uh... As tempting as it is to make that to make that choice, I think I'm going to wait to read the rest of the stories before making that calculation. Because if I build up one of them now, 
Like, who knows? Maybe there's going to be one next week that, like, blows me away. That's true. Yeah, I just meant, like, has there been one that, like, blew you away so far and you're just like, nothing has lived up to it or... Out of what we've read so far. I would say, since I already... Last time we talked about how I've liked trucks for a while. So, like, trucks was, like, classically one of my favorites. But this reading of this book... I'd have to say I Am the Doorway really took me off guard, and that, that'd that be the one I'd say kind of... So far? ...is a hands-down contender um, for me personally. Oh, you might be interested if you want to get a new copy of this book. Uh, so I was looking up the audiobook so I could listen to it on lunch, and the hardcover popped up. Right now they have the hardcover of The Night Shift and the picture on the cover is the hand with all the eyes and like the bandage around it. No way! That I've yeah. seen that cover. Yeah, yeah. it's it's the, it's actually the the art is really cool. You should check it out. Oh, that sounds so cool. Yeah. It's very cool. I saw it and I'm just like, oh man, Noel would love this copy of the book. That would be the addition to buy for sure. Yeah. Nice. So That's which cool. one do you think if he if he's all about I am the doorway currently until we finish this the books the book uh what would be your like top contender so far See I I have two that I've narrowed it down to but the thing is I like them both for different reasons so it's hard to compare them Mhm So one more man is up there <laughs> Because it was the most just bonkers out there story, and I think I had like the most fun with it. But then I also have Jerusalem's Lot, which was just straight up felt like a, it was a real spine chiller, you know. I actually kind of yeah. got spooked reading it, so that hey, was good. Hey, wasn't it's like wasn't uh Boone's assistant named McCann? Yes, in Jerusalem's yeah. Lot. Yes. Okay, because the name of the guy who gives the main character the card in Quitters, his name is McCann, too. Yes, I, I actually did catch that. I forgot really? to mention that. Yeah. 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 Yeah, he's McCann. Oh, my God. Is he possibly a... I thought that's what it was in Jerusalem's Lot, but I, I never actually went back to check. But yeah, It's no. the same. Yeah. They have the same name. Connection, connections. Mm-hmm. So I haven't actually had that one. Go, oh, ahead. go ahead. Oh, I was just gonna say I haven't had that one story that really stood out. I'm still debating on those two because they they're my favorites for very different reasons. Mm-hmm. But yeah, you were gonna you were gonna say something on the McCann, I think. Yeah, I just um, just confirmed that it's the same last name. I thought um, so. So that's pretty interesting. I like uh, those little connections, you know. So maybe McCann didn't die in that church. Or maybe it's just his sister's descendants or something. Maybe. I don't know. I mean, that's a pretty scary dude. I like to believe like he got sucked down and now he's like some henchman of the devil. Eh. Maybe Quitters Inc. is related to to the stuff going on at Jerusalem's Lot. We'll never know. Maybe everything is. Maybe everything originated from Jerusalem's Lot. All the weird stuff. The gray goo. The rats. Everything. The lawnmower man. It's like um, it's like the big uh circle in Germany, in the Black Forest, where like nothing can grow, and they say it's like the gateway to hell, because mm. they say like demons and all bad stuff come out of there, and like mysterious things have happened in the forest, and people have gone missing and that sort of thing. Mm. Wait, really? So the yeah. Black Forest is kind of like. Bermuda Triangle? Uh, yeah, well, this one section of the forest. So, okay. first off, the forest is kind of creepy. If you've seen, like, pictures and stuff. It's very that's, that's where I set, and stuff like that. That's where I set my novel. All year round. 
Huh? That was where I set my novel. Oh. That's where my vampires live. But there's, in the middle of the forest, there's this gigantic, like, open ringed area. Like a perfect circle. And inside of that, like, nothing ever grows. It's, like, infertile. But Weird. It's just, yeah. But it's this perfect circle and nothing grows and so... And people have experienced like weird things happening there, so people are like, "Oh, it's a it's a gateway for demons yeah. to come into the world and that sort of thing." Yeah, maybe. You said it's in Germany. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. So I don't know. Maybe uh, some weird shit happened in World War Two or something. I don't know. Like maybe yeah. some demons or evil forces came through and started infecting everybody with. Like uh, Hellboy. Like yeah, like Hellboy. That's a like, yeah, that's a World War Two thing. Yeah. Yeah, they opened the portal, and that's how Hellboy came in. Well, I also just found out that the Black Forest region in region in Germany is also famous for its cuckoo clocks. Oh, look at that! Demons and cuckoo clocks. What a beautiful What's story. The difference. <laughs> What's the difference, really? But yeah, um, there's Black Forest I, cake too. That sounds good. Yeah, you never had it? Uh, it's delicious. Says the person who doesn't like cake. And I'm saying it, so it's absolutely delicious. Mm, okay. <laughs> um, yeah, I think uh, like people go like camping out there, too. Like, you know, these spirit hunters. and I wouldn't mind doing it. I'd go camping out there. Except there's probably like some radioactive like nuke laboratory that got evacuated and abandoned underneath it back in world war ii and it's the radiation that's killing everything so you go yeah. camp out there and then all of a sudden your kid has five arms and an eye on his hand well i am not having any other children and well no you but... want to go to chernobyl so but maybe i'll end up with eyes on my hand <coughs> will you be the doorway i might be the doorway but we've been ranting, and you haven't told us. Do you have a favorite so far? Anyone that stands out to you? I think I'm also stuck between two. Okay. The Lawnmower Man. <laughs> yeah, Lawnmower Man is just, it's a favorite. And uh, the Boogeyman. The Boogeyman? Yeah, yeah that was a good one. That boogeyman and I really did like Grey Matter. Yeah. See. I really liked Grey Matter because it was just such a classic something's evil in a small town in Maine Stephen King story. It was very classic Stephen King and I really, really liked that about it. And I liked the very blatant it reference in that story. I just liked the the whole vibe of great matter. So I guess it's between three. Oh, you really haven't narrowed it down yet. Though. No. It's between the yeah, three I'm hoping, of them. I'm hoping one of these last five really, uh, really uh, knocks my socks off, you know? So we got Children of the Corn, The Last Rung on the Ladder, The Man Who Loved Flowers, One for the Road, and The Woman in the Room. All right, I can't wait. Those are our final stories. And then we're done with Night Shift, and then we can move on to another book. With such a vague name like The Man Who Loves Flowers, I can already tell it's either going to be a very boring story, and I'm going to be disappointed like I was with Strawberry Spring. Or it's going to be like The Lawnmower. Or it's going to be a crazy story. <laughs> so. I mean, The Woman in the Room. What the hell is that? think we already kind of know children of the corn you know yeah but yeah, yeah i'm excited uh this has been a very fun adventure into into horror and weird weird yeah, stuff just weirdness it's just weirdness <laughs> yeah there's no other way to describe some of this other learned than the keys to good lawn care the keys to good lawn care yep that's important First and foremost, lose the clothes. They're only getting in the way, people. Yep, gotta be naked when you mow your lawn. It's the only way to do it. 
uh, your neighbors might not like it at first, but once they see how beautiful your lawn is, you can be sure they're going to be mowing it naked in the next week. <laughs> Yeah, and don't they mention in the story that doesn't the lawnmower man guy, he's like, yeah, the boss is always looking for new talent. Remember that? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, because he said you he kind of wanted to see if he was interested in coming aboard. Yeah. Because he said, God bless the grass. Yeah. Or whatever he said. Then he called the cops and he ruined it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Man had the perfect job opportunity lined up. Yeah. Yeah. Good benefits. Free lunch. Get the free lunch every day. All you can eat. Yeah. Work from home. Yeah. Yeah. And free lunch, you get protein and vegetable. That's true. Keep what you find. Keep what you find. And, you know, uh, no real dress code. <laughs> nope. <laughs> I don't see how it could be beat. Sign me up. I just uh, make sure the dental's good. You're going to have fuzzy teeth for a while. Yeah. Hairy teeth. Hairy teeth. So what? So Pan recruits people to join his lawn cutter service, and they turn into satyrs? I am thinking maybe that's what it is. Yeah, I guess. Well, doesn't the guy say that when as he's eating the grass, his, his stomach just gets bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger? Yeah. Yeah, so there's got to be some magic going on. Yeah. Well, I guess we may never know. <laughs> <laughs> where's the feature length film about that the lawnmower man uh hang on Funny we... you should ask so i did i was just looking on wikipedia there is they one made, isn't there we made a film called the lawnmower man however it has nothing to do with the story they just stole the title and uh... did something else with it and stephen king was pissed apparently and it was a whole lawsuit or something. Yeah, you should read the Wikipedia page on the movie. Science fiction it. horror movie. Yeah. Pierce Brosnan was in it. Pierce Brosnan? <laughs> yeah. It's got nothing to do with mowing lawns, though. <laughs> yeah, there's no satyrs. There's no naked eating the grass. It's it's different. It's about a... Out, but it's different. It's about a man who is obsessed with evolving into a digital being. Based on The Lawnmower Man by Stephen King, uncredited after a lawsuit. It's not based on it. That is nothing like it. Yeah, man. They just stole the title. That's all. They just stole the name. Man, I'm angry for Stephen. Oh my god, originally titled Stephen King's The Lawnmower Man, King successfully sued to have his name removed from the credits. He won further damages when his name was included in the title of the home video release. Oh, so they used him as a marketing ploy. like Yeah, yeah. yeah. I would have sued him too. Yeah. Oh, all day. The only reason is because the main story is, is uh, both stories involve a gardener who operates a lawnmower. Oh, well, Jesus, okay. I'm going to make a movie based off of him, too. and yeah. So messed up. Poor Stephen King. Him he got... He, 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 he made it out all right, I yeah. think. <laughs> uh, but on that note, I think we've said all we can about these stories. Especially the lawnmower man, we talked about that a lot. <laughs> we did, we did. Oh my god, this cover art is so great! <laughs> Look at that. <laughs> it's the cover art for Marvel Magazine's original publication. Oh my god, it's hilarious. That's awful. It's so terrifying. Ooh, um, gosh. Well. On that note, though, thank on that you note. for everyone who joined us. 
We will be back next week with more All the Young Dudes, followed by the last five stories of Stephen King. Night Shift. Night Shift. When when, uh, afterwards, I just want to throw this out here because I forgot to put in our update video. Stop showing me those. Those are disgusting images. (laughs) Showing me, like, fan art of the lawnmower, man. Uh, It's a graphic novel. Ew. It's a graphic novel. I forgot to put it in uh, our update video, but the next book we will be reading is How Do You Live? By oh shoot, I forgot who it was by. Shame on you, Yoshino something. Oh, there we go. Here. Well, you can just look up uh, "How Do You Live" by Neil Gaiman because he does the American version. But originally by oh, that's actually that's the that's the movie. Mm-hmm. Who. Someone prepared for this. There, you can you can say you're better at pronouncing these na- Japanese names. Genzaburo Yoshino. How do you live by Genzaburo Yoshino? Very nice. Uh, Good job. Also credited to Neil Gaiman and being turned into the next Miyazaki film, which is the big reason why we're reading it. Yay! I'm excited. Miyazaki came out of retirement to turn this into a full length film. So. I'm yeah, super excited. I'm, I'm very Me excited. Too. I'm yeah, very I'm excited. Look, it, it should be a change of pace from. from I want to. Sh- I wish I could show everyone. I know we're taking a big like 180. It's like we've yeah. gone from Stephen King to this coming of age children's novel, being turned into a animated film by arguably the world's greatest traditional animator of all time. Oh yeah, I can't wait. Yep, should be fun. Mm-hmm. I'm very excited, and maybe we can get back to Stephen King another time because there's there's plenty of Stephen King to go around. Oh yeah, I like the I like the 180. Me too. Yeah, it should I like the uh, to change it up? So yeah, sounds good. All right. Well, until then, everyone, take care. We'll see you next week. See you next time. All right.